Hi, I'm Ben, a PhD student here at Imperial, and over the next few minutes, I'll be taking you on a virtual nature walk around my own corner of North London, hoping to show you some of the fantastic wildlife that thrives here in this very human landscape. I'll also try to give you some tips to help you experience your own local wildlife, wherever you are. In these strange times, it's hard to get out of your local area, let alone venture abroad. But really, you don't need to jet off to exotic destinations or even visit a nature reserve to see amazing wildlife. There is an astonishing diversity of life all around you, whether you live in the depths of the countryside or, like me, in the heart of urban London. This walk is a part of Imperial Sustainability Week, if you haven't done so already, please do visit our website where you can sign up for the Sustainable Imperial newsletter and read about the university's new sustainability strategy. All the details and links are in the description below. I've just stepped out of my flat into a fairly typical residential area of London. And although you might not think there's much going on here, I'm frequently surprised at how much wildlife I see within just a few seconds of leaving my front door. Small groups of starlings are a frequent sight. Although they've declined enormously throughout the UK, they remain relatively common in urban areas. Perhaps because of their former ubiquity, these birds often receive little attention, but I think they are amongst the most strikingly beautiful of all British species. Sometimes I'll also hear the delicate tinkling of a flock of goldfinches flying over. These gorgeous birds have increased in number around our towns and cities and readily use garden feeders. Foxes are often out after dark all around London. We've just had the peak of the red fox mating season, which tends to last from January to early February, and you may well have heard the bizarre, blood-curdling screams of courting dogs and vixens. The most common winged predator in these urban areas is probably the sparrowhawk. Just the other day, one came shooting past me down the street, and that's often the only view you'll get. When they're hunting, they'll fly fast and low along a hedgerow or garden wall before barrel rolling over the top to startle and catch unsuspecting small birds. But while sparrowhawks are more numerous, it's always worth keeping an eye on the sky for perhaps the most iconic of all urban birds of prey, the peregrine falcon. The fastest animal on earth, peregrines are thriving in London, where pigeons provide a rich food source and the buildings mimic the cliffs and rocky gorges of their natural habitat. Now, while totally urban areas do support much more wildlife than you might expect, it's London's parks that are its greatest refuges for nature. One of the best things about this city is that you're never far from a green space. In fact, there are around 3,000 of them, ranging in size from just a few square feet to over 2,000 acres. I'm on my way now to one of the largest, Hampstead Heath, which is home to a remarkable variety of habitats and wildlife. Let's see what we can find. I've just reached the southeastern corner of the heath. Behind me are 800 acres of woodland, meadows and ponds. But while I'm certainly lucky to live near such a large expanse of green, even the smallest space can support an impressive amount of wildlife, and many of the species I'm hoping to see today can be found throughout the city and beyond. One of the most conspicuous birds in any London park is also perhaps the most incongruous, the ring-necked parakeet. With their bright green plumage and raucous, ceaseless screeching, they're certainly hard to miss. Debates over how these exotic birds first arrived here have raged for decades. Some say Jimi Hendrix released a pair on Carnaby Street in the 60s, 
while others contend that a flock escaped from the set of The African Queen, starring Audrey Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart. The truth, sadly, seems to be more mundane. Parakeets have been popular pets for centuries, and occasional escapes were inevitable. At first, it was assumed that these tropical birds would die out after one or two cold winters, but the ring-necked parakeet's natural range reaches well into the foothills of the Himalayas, so they're perfectly comfortable in London's mild climate. In fact, they're thriving, with tens of thousands of birds now living wild across the capital. They breed in tree cavities, and there are concerns they may outcompete native hole nesting birds, such as nuthatches and tree creepers. But they're now so numerous that, for better or worse, they seem to be here to stay. Now, I have to admit, I don't often go out without my trusty binoculars, and if you do have a pair, then they can be an invaluable piece of kit for helping you to identify and observe wildlife. But if you don't have any, don't let that stop you from getting out in nature. Sometimes it can be incredibly rewarding to leave the binoculars at home and just be completely reliant on your own senses. Another piece of advice I'd give to gain a deeper appreciation of nature is to really pay attention to animal behaviour. Next time you're watching something familiar, like a blue tit or a grey squirrel, ask yourself, what is it actually doing? Is it feeding, socialising, displaying, or perhaps something else entirely? One brilliant place to try this is on your garden bird feeder. Watch the birds come and go for a few minutes and see if you can pick out any patterns. Are some species dominant over others? Can you even notice hierarchies within species? It can be so easy after a first view of something to tick it off and move on. But by taking things a bit more slowly, we can gain a fascinating insight into the lives of creatures we often take for granted. One of my favourite things to do is to find a quiet spot somewhere, sit down and simply wait and watch. You can do this anywhere a small patch of woodland, your back garden, or maybe, like me, by a small pond or other landscape feature that's likely to attract wildlife. In our busy lives, we're so used to rushing around with our heads down that it's easy to forget the value of patience. But if you give this a try, for a minute or five or thirty, I think you'll be amazed at how much life you notice around you. You could even close your eyes completely and just listen. Right now I can hear song thrush and robin singing in the woods behind me. There's a greenfinch wheezing away on the other side and I can see a really nice range of water birds out on the pond. Although kingfishers are often seen here, I haven't been lucky today. Lakes in London's parks can often support an excellent diversity of wildfowl, especially in winter when numbers are at their highest including of striking species like this tufted duck. Cormorants are a regular sight throughout the year. Their feathers are less water resistant than those of other water birds, helping them to forage more easily underwater, but requiring them to spend time drying their wings after feeding. It might feel like we're in the depths of winter right now, but spring is just around the corner, and over the next few weeks and months, the lengthening days will transform this landscape and the lives of the creatures within it. Already, birdsong is starting to fill these woods with the varied, repeated phrases of the song thrush, one of my particular favourites. Soon, our resident species will be joined by a host of summer migrants, all contributing to a spectacular dawn chorus. Although the early morning is the best time to experience it, in urban areas, artificial light can prompt birds to sing through the night. Not all birds sing to attract a mate, however, and you should also listen out for the rhythmic drumming of the great spotted woodpecker, a species common wherever there are trees, from ancient woodlands through to city parks. 
So far on this walk, we've mostly been focusing on birds, largely because at this time of year, they are by far the most visible animals around. But before long, a much greater variety of creatures and plants will be on show. Keep an eye out over the next few weeks for spring flowers. You may already have seen the year's first snowdrops, and it won't be long before carpets of primroses begin to bloom. Warmer weather will also bring out butterflies, bright yellow brimstones, peacocks, red admirals and commas. These species hibernate as adults, so are often the first to emerge, alongside various bumblebees and beetles. Not far behind the insects will be bats, usually from about April onwards. Several species are common in London, from tiny pipistrelles up to the much larger noctule. And if you're out and about on the heath, or anywhere with still or slow moving water, keep an eye out for Dorbenton's bat, which often snatches insects from around the surface of lakes and ponds. Now, I know there are plenty of people out there who, although they'd love to see more wildlife, just have a hard time spotting it. And I'm often struck myself at how easy it is to miss things when I keep my eyes facing forward and forget to look around. Look up, but you might just spot a bird of prey, perhaps even a peregrine passing overhead. Look down and maybe that butterfly sunning itself on the path will catch your eye before your next step startles it. It's amazing how many times I've had a dragonfly, bird or even a snake burst out from beneath my feet. And don't forget to look sideways too. There could always be something sitting unnoticed close to the path. Here's a great example of what I mean. I was just following a little flock of goldfinches along this hedgerow when I suddenly realised I was standing right underneath a gorgeous male kestrel. This is a bird that requires areas of relatively undisturbed grassland, so they're only found in London's larger parks, although they're still fairly common across much of the UK. While they're most famous for their ability to hover, they do sometimes hunt from stationary perches. Notice how incredibly still he keeps his head while scanning for prey. Like many birds, kestrels can see into the ultraviolet spectrum. This allows them to pick up reflections from small mammal urine, helping them to pinpoint the location of their next meal. I really hope you've enjoyed this virtual wildlife walk and that it's inspired you to get out in nature yourself. One thing that's so important to emphasise is that none of the places we've visited today has been in the least unusual. Many of the creatures we've seen and talked about can be found almost anywhere, even in the most urban areas. No matter where you live, you will always be surrounded by fascinating wildlife and I hope some of the tips in this video will help you to experience it. If there are to be any positive legacies of these lockdowns, perhaps one could be that people come away with a deeper understanding of how much wonderful wildlife we have on our doorstep, and even a greater desire to see it protected. With around 90% of us here in the UK now living in urban areas, where it's so easy to feel cut off from nature, it's more crucial than ever that people engage with the wildlife around them. See the description for links to the Imperial Sustainability Week website, information on the university's new sustainability strategy, and instructions on how to sign up to the Sustainable Imperial newsletter. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. And if you have any questions or just want to get in touch, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below.